I am indeed thankful for the opportunity that was given to me to speak on this lectureship. It's always a, a, privilege, a privilege to do so, not only speak, but especially on this lectureship in particular. Now, over the past, well, actually, I should be thankful for the meal that we just enjoyed, as was all those who contributed to the making of it. Now, the challenge is extended to me to keep each and every one of us awake. The greater the meal, the greater the challenge. Now, throughout this lectureship so far, we have heard, we have considered and studied different aspects of the gospel of Christ. We have discussed how this gospel addresses man's greatest and most severe issue, problem, and that is sin. We have discussed how it removes the love and the practice of this problem of sin. Now this hour, we will consider a promise of the gospel. As stated, this, the subject of study is how the gospel erases the guilt of sin. Now in any kind of discussion we're going to have, it is always useful to define our terms. It's quite a lengthy reading, but I think it very beneficial. I would like to define this word guilt from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. It elaborates very well on this concept of guilt as follows. The Christian idea of guilt involves three elements, responsibility, blameworthiness, and the obligation to make good through punishment or compensation. In other words, in thinking of guilt, we ask the questions of cause, motive, and consequence, the central idea being that of the personal blameworthiness of the sinner. In the Old Testament, the idea of guilt corresponds to that of righteousness or holiness. When these are ritual and legal, instead of ethical and spiritual, they will determine similarly the idea of guilt. The legalistic and ritualistic conception of guilt may first be noted. Personal blameworthiness does not need to be present. And if a soul sin and commit any of these things which were forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist it not or knew it not, yet is he guilty and shall bear his iniquity. That is Leviticus chapter 5 verse 17. The man is guilty not because he might or should have known, he may merely have touched unwittingly the body of an unclean beast. Leviticus chapter 5 verse 23. The guilt is here because the law has been transgressed and must be made good. The central idea in all of this is not that of the individual, his responsibility, his motive, his blame. It is that of a rule and the transgression of it, which must be made good. For this reason, we see the ideas of sin and guilt and punishment constantly passing over into each other. With the prophets, the ideas of sin and righteousness come out more clearly as ethical and personal. And so we mark a similar advance in the conception of guilt. It is not ritual correctness that counts with God, incense and sacrifices and new moons and Sabbaths, but to cease to do evil to learn to do well, such as in Isaiah chapter 1. Thus the motive and the inner spirit come in, and guilt gains a new depth and quality. At the same time, the idea of personal responsibility comes. A man is to bear his own sins. The children's teeth are not to be set on edge because the fathers have eaten sour grapes. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 29 and 30. Because it is not primarily a matter of the outward deed, but of the inner spirit, Jesus marks different degrees of guilt as depending upon a man's knowledge and motive. 
as found in Luke chapter 11, verses 29 through 32. And yet, Jesus does not lighten the sense of guilt, but rather deepens it. The strength of the Old Testament thought lay in this, that it viewed all transgression as a sin against God, since all laws come from Him. Here comes the New Testament interpretation of the cross, which shows it on the one hand as the measure of God's love in the free gift of His Son, and on the other as the measure of man's guilt, whose sin wrought this and made it necessary. Again, that was ISBE, definition of guilt. Now Webster's defines guilt as the following. The fact of having committed a breach of conduct, especially violating law and involving penalty. Secondly, the state of one who has committed an offense, especially consciously. Third, feelings of deserving blame, especially for imagined offenses or from a sense of inadequacy. And fourth, a feeling of deserving blame for offenses. Keeping in mind both of these definitions, we can categorize guilt into two separate classes. Guilt that comes from violating a body of law, which we will refer to as legal guilt. And secondly, the guilt that comes from knowing that you have done something wrong. We will refer to this going forward as emotional guilt. With all this in mind, let us consider, if any, as far as who might be guilty. Who is guilty? Well, the book of Romans, beginning in chapter, chapter 1, Paul reasons and shows that the Gentiles are all guilty before God. Again, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. We see in verse 21 that all of mankind at some point in our history knew who God was. However, as time progressed, man chose not to retain God in their knowledge. Verse 28 of Romans 1. Because of this, God gave them up. Verse 24, verse 26, and verse 28. As is typical of mankind, godliness, godlessness rather, persisted. And mankind continued down the paths of sin. So much so that sin became the norm. It became what we would consider second nature. This concept is seen in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3. Then Paul reasons that even the Jews were guilty before God. Romans chapter 2 verses 17 through 29. You see the Jews relied upon the law of Moses to save them. Verse 17 of this chapter. Instead of being obedient and blameless, they had become hypocrites. Verses 18 through 23. They were so deep in error that God's name was blasphemed by the Gentiles because of the Jews. Verse 24 of Romans 2. Paul points out that physical circumcision only profits them if and only if they obeyed or kept the law of Moses. Verses 25 through 29. Thus, the Jews have no advantage over the Gentiles. Romans chapter 3, verse 1. Paul then reasons that if both Jew and Gentile are guilty, all are guilty. Jews are no better than the Gentiles. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Which reads, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. We have before proved that both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Paul gives a general summary of man's outlook toward God in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. Generally, no one has the proper fear of Jehovah God. Without this proper fear, man will sin against him. Because of all this, all have sinned. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Through sin we transgress the law of God, as has been read, uh, referenced earlier, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. 
Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also, also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. This refers to the legal guilt we referenced earlier. Ignorance never excuses one from guilt before God. We must always realize this. We must remember this in all that we do. Legal guilt is real, even if one is not aware of the error that they have committed. This is true whether one's conscience has been pricked or not. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. We see this from that audience there. One is still held accountable before God as guilty of sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14. Legal guilt often brings about emotional guilt. This can be considered a side effect of violating a law, specifically God's law. It can be manifested in different ways, such as anxiety, depression, doubt, and even fear, different phobias. Ultimately, guilt keeps people from receiving and maintaining the peace that passes all understanding. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. We see in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 22, that there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Some, however, may not experience this emotional guilt. This could be due to their conscience being seared. As in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, and 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Whether someone has emotional guilt or not does not remove the fact that they have legal guilt before God. <coughs> Next, we know that we have this guilt. What exactly can remove this guilt from us? Can the Old Testament remove this guilt from us? Can the law of Moses remove our legal guilt? We must know a few things about the law of Moses. The law of Moses was perfect for what it was designed to perform. The law of Moses revealed sin and showed its severity. It was added due to sin. Galatians chapter 3 verse 19, which reads, Wherefore then serve the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Then we notice that it was given, or it gave the people the knowledge of sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. We know that sin was shown to be horrendous because of the law of Moses. Romans chapter 7, verse 13. Was then that which is good? made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. You see, it was designed to point to the fact that sin is a despicable thing. It's a horrendous thing. It is severe. And ultimately, it brought about the death of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. The law of Moses showed that man could not be saved by a pure law system. As found in Acts chapter 13, verses 38 and 39, and Romans chapter 3, verse 20. The old law, however, was good and holy. Romans chapter 7, verse 12. However, it alone could not save. The law of Moses could not remit the sins of the people. Since this is the case, Israel would still hold both legal guilt and emotional guilt under the law of Moses. We see this in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 through 10, which reads, The Holy Ghost, this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings, 
and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Then we must consider Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they have ceased, they would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. From these two passages we must note the following. The animal sacrifices were not able to remove sin. These sacrifices could not clear the conscience of those who offered them. The law of Moses alone was unable to remove the sins of the people. However, the law of Moses pointed to a superior law. This new law would be the good things to come. Thus, one cannot go to the Old Testament with the expectation of receiving the remission of sins. Since this is the case, it is unreasonable for one to expect then the ease of one's guilt, both legal and emotional. You cannot obtain either of these by going to the law of Moses. There is but one thing that promises to remove the guilt of our sins, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel promises to remove sin and legal guilt. This is possible because of the remission of sins found only in the gospel of Christ. We point to the meaning of remission, which is freedom, pardon, deliverance, forgiveness, and liberty. Jesus himself said that his blood would be shed for the remission of sins. Mark chapter 14, verse 24, Luke chapter 22, verse 20, and Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. In instituting the, the Lord's Supper, he there says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. It is this remission of sins that is to be preached to the whole world. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 20. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. As was well Luke chapter 24, verses 45 and 47. Which reads, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third, the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his, in his name among all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Jesus promised that remaining his disciple and knowing the truth would make one free or liberated. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then... Are ye my disciples indeed? And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Peter preached that remission of sins could be received by believing in Jesus, Acts chapter 10, verse 43, as well as repentance and baptism, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. What then is involved in the remission of sins? Returning to the ISBE, to expand our concept of remission, it says, Remission is exemption from the consequences of an offense. Forgiveness. Sins are remitted when the offender is treated as though the offense had never been committed. You see, upon complying with the terms of pardon, one's sins are remitted. They're forgiven. It is, at, it is as if we individually are on trial for our offenses. Our sin makes us worthy of death. However, contacting the blood of our Savior by obeying the gospel causes the charges to be dropped against us. 
The case then is dismissed and we are released from custody. We need to consider some terms that are used as synonyms to describe the act of our remission of sins. We see in John chapter 1 verse 29 as well as Romans chapter 11 verse 27 that our sins are taken away. Our sins are blotted out. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Our sins have been washed away. Acts chapter 22 verse 16. Our sins are covered. Romans chapter 4 verse 7. They are no longer imputed against us. Romans chapter 4 verse 8. We are noted as being made free from sin. Romans chapter 6 verses 17 and 18. Our sins are purged from us. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 9. Our sins are remembered no more. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12. Each of these terms points to the removal of guilt from the sinner. Another term that can be used to describe one whose sins have been remitted is the word justified. One who is justified is considered not guilty. We consider Romans chapter 3 verses 24 through 26. Paul there writes, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. After, lift, after listing these different forms of unrighteousness, Paul points out that the brethren at Corinth are no longer guilty of such things. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, which he there says, And such were some of you, again referencing the different sins that they had committed as members of the world. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the, of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Thus, when the gospel is obeyed, one promise received is the remission of sins. It then follows that the legal guilt that that sinner had is now removed. Next, we consider that the gospel of Christ removes emotional guilt via remission of sins. The gospel is able to ease or clear our conscience through this remission of sins. The blood of Christ makes this possible. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 11 through 14. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And then once more in Hebrews chapter 10, Verses 19 through 22. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of, of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and one full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Our high priest, Jesus the Christ, makes it possible to cleanse our consciences by the shedding of his blood. His blood purges our conscience from dead works. It takes our conscience from being evil to being pure. We then have full assurance that this can and does occur at the point of remission of sins. As a result, we have legitimate reason to not feel emotional guilt for the sins that we had 
committed prior to the remission of those sins. For we have been fully forgiven of them by Christ's blood. Because of this, we can be set free from the symptoms we mentioned earlier. Anxiety, depression, doubt, and fear. <coughs> the gospel then helps one to maintain what God has given us. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. You see, those are gifts from God. It is individually our responsibility to, re re to maintain these aspects. A sound mind. Being remitted of our sins helps us to keep the soundness of our minds. So part of that is knowing that our sins have been remitted. Though we might think back on them and hopefully regret doing them, and hopefully even more so learning from them, they're not held against us anymore. Then we see that the gospel allows one to have peace and joy. This is due to the justification that we receive via grace. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And then Philippians 4, verse 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When one obeys the gospel, they have full right to enjoy this promise of living guilt-free, specifically with emotional guilt. After all, one's sins have been remitted at the point of obedience and remission of sin. Thus, one's emotional guilt is then removed. We must keep in mind that this promise is offered to all men. However, only those who are obedient will have the right to benefit from it. Obeying the plan of salvation set forth by Jehovah God in the, law, in the testament of Jesus Christ is the only way to receive these promises. Belief in Jesus as the Son of God, John chapter 8, verse 24. Repenting of our sins, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Confessing Christ publicly, Romans chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. And then being baptized into Christ, Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 38. Note the process that occurs when one fully obeys the gospel. Those on Pentecost were convicted of the sins that they had committed and were then given the remedy, Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. There it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now then they heard this, and they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, <coughs> Excuse me. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. They would receive freedom or remission from legal guilt. Then receive remission from emotional guilt. We must note 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. The life figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we see the remission of sins is offered through obedience to the gospel. And finally, once one complies with the final term, that is baptism, one is able then to receive remission of emotional guilt. Now as we wrap this lesson up, this hour we have discussed, we have discussed what guilt is, we have considered in depth what it means for us. We have considered the categories of this guilt. There is legal guilt, 
There's emotional guilt. We have shown from the scriptures who exactly is guilty before God. Ultimately, the entire world is guilty before God. When an individual reaches an age where they understand the difference between right and wrong, and they do wrong anyway, they have sinned before God, thus are guilty in a legal sense. Now, when they learn better, and they understand that what they did was wrong even more in depth, God gave us a conscience. And that conscience, based on the intellect that we have, the information that we have to, to use, that conscience is going to tell us one or two things. Either feel bad for what you did or feel good. Whenever we sin against God and we know we've done wrong, our conscience says, you ought to feel bad. That's emotional guilt. Now oftentimes, well every time rather, we're tempted. And through weakness of the flesh, we succumb to that temptation. And so doing, we have violated God's law, which makes us guilty in the legal sense. And as we said, during or due to the conscience, we're guilty of emotional guilt. And rightly so. We should feel guilty. We have violated our Creator's commands. But it shouldn't end there. It should spur us to try to find the remedy of that guilt. Now this hour we have discussed the remedy for our sin and all sin that we commit. The remedy is the gospel of Christ and it properly obeyed. God has extended this plan for man's salvation. As we said, it is offered to all. But we as an individual must accept it. We must do something about it. It is up to the individual to accept God's plan and then to obey that plan. <clears throat> Only upon complying can one's sins be remitted never to be held against them again. At that point, when we comply to God's plan of salvation, our sins are removed from us. As it says, He will remember our sins no more. They're never going to be held against us. You know, feeble man, we, we sometimes remember what people do wrong and they, what they might do against us. And maybe after a period of years when an individual has wronged us, and maybe they repented, for this situation, let's say they did. But then, we want to be spiteful. We'll remember that instance, and we'll hold it against them, as if it's some sort of blackmail. That doesn't happen with God. When we repent, we are forgiven. That sin is erased from our, our record. At that point, one then is free from both legal guilt which comes from violating God's law, as well as the side effect of legal guilt, which is emotional guilt, that often and should plague one's conscience. Now, obeying the gospel of Christ for one's entire life will grant us heaven. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. I certainly hope this hour of, of study has been beneficial to you. I certainly appreciate your attention. Thank you for your time.